uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen and uh, my dear students once again welcome to the nehru science center virtual lockdown lecture series um, you are aware that from uh, march onwards um, as a part of the lockdown for the the health safety of our esteemed uh, visitors our science center has been closed to you but however uh, we have always been trying to connect with you so that the facilities of the science center are made available to you you are aware that uh, we have had some wonderful lectures uh, by top most scientists uh, and we have also connected with you the astronomical observations uh, live telescope observation workshops demonstration and in that direction we are currently having this particular lecture on behalf of the nehru science center the national council of science museum the ministry of culture it gives me immense pleasure to welcome our today's uh, speaker who is none other than uh, dr ramadurai sir um, i think all of you are aware that uh, he has been a doyen um, in the it field um, in the current uh, pandemic era where disruption perhaps is a new norm um, the old over uh, disruption we have to live with the disruption uh, sir is going to be talking about uh, disruption digitization and demand i'll give a brief background of uh, uh, ramadurai sir ramadurai sir has been associated with uh, uh, the, the tata consultancy services tcs now is a is a global brand very recently it has become a 1 billion dollar in the um, um, industry um, tcs also was at the forefront of uh, taking it to the world um, which now is about 191 uh, billion dollar industry Uh, ramadurai sir from very beginning in the 1969 when he joined the tcs right up to 2009 when he left uh, the tcs he has been there for about 40 years and during his tenure of just 13 years um, at the helm of uh, tcs from a 600 uh, crore company he has converted into a, a 36000 crore company uh, in 2009 when he laid down the office as things stand today um, the it's it's grown 10 times more i mean it will be 20 times more it's almost a 6 lakh crore uh, company uh, this is going to be the new norm i'm sure uh, the the pandemic has brought a lot of disruption sir is going to talk about uh, among amidst this disruption how indian it companies and all of you the students our eight students who are going to be the future uh, citizens and leaders of the it industry are going to be benefited sir once again sir on behalf of all our esteemed audience the nehru science center and the ministry of culture i welcome you sir thank you so much mr uh, shiva prasad ji i'm so happy to be part of the nehru science center virtual lockdown lecture series this morning i deliberately chose this topic on disaster disruption digitization and demand what is called for i'll talk about some of the positive as well as the negative aspects of the disruption more importantly all of us these days when we go to bed every day in the evening thinking that the pandemic is over and tomorrow it will be a different day every morning we get up and see that the pandemic cases across the country and across the world has beaten the previous day's record and we move on completely absorbing social distancing facial mask and personal hygiene as the core and that we need to accept as the new normal because we are reminded day in and day out for our own good as well as the others we stay safe stay healthy and we take care of ourselves as we speak i just read this morning that we have crossed over to and a half lakh cases in india and maharashtra has crossed the china tally of 83000 and the two months lockdown has had about uh, 3000 deaths deaths in our own state the total deaths in india is about 7200 just as a beginning now the theme of the talk on the five d's and how with the right perspective and drawing an inspiration from our deepest traditions of diversity we can lead towards a world of new possibilities and opportunities and i'll articulate a few of them if i go to the first slide 
which is, these are all hand-drawn charts by one of my colleagues. This is a flood, which is a natural cause. And um, we have seen it. We have experienced it in uh, the 26th of July, a couple of years ago, where I was one of those affected where I had to walk from uh, Bandra to a sea phase, knee deep of our uh, chest deep of water. I think the second one, when I looked at the pandemic, starting from the third plague in 1885 to COVID-19, which started in this year or early last year, end of last year, I think uh, the global deaths have overtaken almost uh, 3,91,000. And India, as I said, has gone over 7,200. I think we have transitioned from the early part of the century and I was looking at some photographs of the Spanish flu where the facial masks were very visible and quite a few of the photographs are available today, almost the same way of social distancing. And then when I look at the yellow fever, Russian flu, Spanish flu, or the Asian flu, or the Hong Kong flu, HIV, AIDS, Ebola, SARS, I think the number of deaths in India, one was the Spanish flu, which caused about 17 to 18 million deaths across our country. And then the HIV AIDS, about 70,000. So these are some things to remember that the pandemics are going to be there. Pandemics are going to be a part of us. And the natural disasters, whether it is due to the climate change or whether it is due to man-made ones like the world wars, like the terrorist attacks, the Mumbai attack in 1993, or the one in uh, subsequently. I think these have caused an enormous amount of uh, problems for us. I think the next one, which talks about the incident of a terrorist uh, where the Taj Mahal Hotel was affected. And the more important point is how the citizens rose up to support the city, support that uh, people, uh, support those who are affected, the kind of community initiatives that came up together. This will be one of the themes I will definitely uh, talk about. I think the other one, which is the next one, shows a visual on the migrant workers. And I think what a kind of disruption it has created, both in terms of the personal loss as well as the economic distress, which is playing out. Now, the thing that has led to some of these migrations or the movement of the migrant workers back to their villages, one is because of the public health related challenges, inadequate capacity. Second is um, the need to go back to their villages because they feel safer there. They want to see their family and these things, family and friends. More importantly, they consider the stay in the uh, urban centers purely as a temporary one and village as the permanent home, in spite of the fact most of the salaries which they earn is sent back to the family. And we need to address this problem as we go into the future, as we look at the disruption that are happening. Of course, the next one, where the railway stepped in to address to make sure that people were observing to some extent the social distance, but then the end-to-end -end thinking was still lacking. And uh, we... Uh, took them to their destinations. But then the challenges of inadequate capacity in terms of testing, beds, ambulance, masks, or ventilators, and the human capital shortfall are some of the things which we need to address as we go to the future. The frontline workers, the doctors, the nurses, the security staff, police, and their safety is of paramount importance. As we see some of them also getting affected, and we need to work at it. 
Now, the things that took care of some of them in terms of the positive ones were uh, the Manrega, where the demand is for almost 11 crores today, and the 100 days of work for each member of the BPL family has increased the daily wage to 212 rupees per day, and the budget allocation also also gone up to about 100,000 crores. And how do we integrate some of the skills into the Mandrega itself and also increase the number of days? Agricultural workers is another uh, distress and almost uh, 25 crore of the agricultural workers because of the land depletion are affected and their produce reach the market because of the economic and the lockdown distress is going to be important to be addressed. Construction workers we saw an enormous amount of job losses. Almost five crore people work in this sector, and that needs to come back quickly. And what is it that needs to be done before they come back to us? I think the other one was the major one is the MSME sector, where 11 crores are employed in India, and that's almost 90% of our industrial units are in the MSME segment. They add about 45% of the value, industrial value add. I think 96% um, of the MSMEs in this country are proprietary, adding up to about 63 million, million MSMEs. And then the, we add 5 to 10 million new workers into this system every year. Majority of them go into the micro small industries. I think this is an issue which is currently facing an enormous amount of challenge, both in terms of access to funds, some of the past receivables, and last but not the least, is the demand. Now let's look at the positive aspects of the uh, disruption, where the chart five, that is the STDISD, the one I'm reflecting, one of the technologies that is the emotional toll of migration was the simple phone booth way back in the past. The public telephone was widely perceived to be a great positive disruption as it enabled one to actually speak with, uh, speak with one's relatives working far away from home. I think the relevance to our own industry, a far greater disruption also is happening where the whole revolution with the communication capabilities available in the 80s, the offshoring and the offshore model got more or less invented. The next chart which shows one of the TCS campuses was how do you work out of a facility like this in a remote mode connected to the client in any part of the world, the workforce working out of this beautiful facility. I think the trust which was built by the IT workforce across multiple companies with the global clients and connected through the communication links became a model which achieved mainstream. We saw it, that in the 90s, the 2000s, etc. And the phenom uh, phenomenal infrastructure that was created. I think uh, one of the points I want to make here is a journey of sustained excellence does not happen overnight. And the model where I just want to branch for a short while, for a short uh, minute, is when you look at why Kerala has handled this pandemic a lot better than the other states in the country. The state achieved, the uh, Kerala achieved statehood in 1964. The public health initiative started in the same year. We are talking about 1964 and the capacity building and rollout and the way they have a community connect, the community health connects and the empowerment across the panchayat level, district level and then playing it out. Household visits, all of them have played out with regard to awareness, literacy, education and ability to address this. There are a lot of lessons to be learned from that. I think uh, the journey of excellence in any of these, where one this country has to look at, is absolutely critical that we need to understand this. 
I think uh, the IT industry, more importantly, grew uh, in spite of the government. And more recently, the government has given a lot of support. And the power of digitization has also been embraced by the government in a very accelerated manner. And that's what you are seeing in the next slide with regard to the Digital India slide, where access from any part of the country through a smartphone, through internet, through more affordable devices or affordable access, the remote connectivity and the content to support some of these things are becoming available. And a lot of entrepreneurial energy is being spent on this. I think the Jam Trinity has been studied by several governments the, for essentially delivering social services, which we call as a DBT. I think uh, digitization will not stop with the uh, delivery of citizen services. I think innovation that are requiring the latest computer technologies in the next chart depicts it even goes beyond the typical area of um, banking, financial services, insurance, etc. Here, what we are showing is our artisans, namely the weavers, to pursue a 21st century livelihood using the internet. Our weavers are able to fabricate the finest fabrics on their handlooms for their customers in any part of the world, which means the market and the demand through the innovation and an incorporation of a digital weaving, but the designs, the mind in the patterns, any pattern can be offloaded from abroad and then made on this at such a short time. And the time compression, the creativity of the weaver just gets enhanced and it does not get removed. So the when we talk about uh, 3 million of the people in this kind of uh, area, the power of the digitization and the digital technology is uh, very crucial. Going to the next one, what are the problems that are still bothering us? Unmet demands like water or the health, hygiene, and access to education, these had to be addressed, addressed because of the disruption and because of the acceleration possible with the technology in a much faster manner, but it's not a replacement, it's what I call as a digital plus physical model, and some of them call it as a digital model. So the women carrying the pots on their heads is to show the acute critical need for water, water and the water initiative taken by the government. This one is welcome, but I think the implementation has to ensure that everybody has access to water within a distance which is acceptable. This is an example of a disruptive innovation where the short of fame in the early 1980s, this was a result of an active and emphatic collaboration, empathetic collaboration between a UK returned orthopedic surgeon and an accomplished craftsman and of course the community philanthropy. This is what I call as the Jaipur foot and a large number of amputees to become self-reliant once again and stand on their own legs. I think this was an innovation where four scopes by an IIT Kanpur alumnus and professor at Stanford, these are one of the examples where the young children in remote villages can cut a thin sliver of onion on a dam's fly, or a dam's fly wing and put it under the microscope now. I think teenage school children can learn to even weld using some of the simulators and products have been created for this kind of an environment. I think uh, you see the demand in various sectors, demand from a social context which we need to do, skilling, education, and of course the IT as it relates to the various sectors. Now coming to the pandemic itself and what the country learned in a very short time, as we started building the capacity was, how do you start manufacturing things like the facial mask or the personal protection equipment or the ventilators and also some of the other surgical equipment. And this is becoming mainstream. And this is one moment as I see it, where 
adversity in front of us in the form of a pandemic which calls for action in a more positive way while we try to address these challenges i think um, coming to a few examples in the digitization itself i think there are three or four examples which i have picked up one is the education and skilling which through an initiative called tcs ion we have been able to scale up to some phenomenal numbers starting from 2012 to today i think one is able to assess about 210 million candidates 50 million this year alone and physical presence across the country including places like baramula or asansol or dibrugarh varanasi gorakhpur etc tier 3 tier 4 centers and the objective is to reach all the districts in the country for children to access including the content that will be available and 113 patents have been filed and the number of patents have been granted so essentially b2c learners of the number we are talking about at least 4 million b2c learners the second innovation which came very very recently is what we call as a secure borderless workspace i showed you some time ago a campus where the offshore model was uh, done and now the next level of evolution which has forced because of the pandemic and the disruption that has come about is 95% of the workforce and almost all the it companies will work out of their homes with a terminal or a laptop and it's a location independent model to ensure that could it maintains the same level of delivery excellence what the customers in any part of the world expect uh, expect, uh, expect from it i think the possibilities are remote working from any part of the world and any part of the country more importantly so long as the bandwidth and the power on demand are possible we can conduct a global business without any disruption to the service which the global clients want or any client in any part of the country also want so a disruption what we call as a secure borderless workspace again the message i don't want you to forget is these are all sustained innovation initiatives over a period of years with innovation r and d implementation by uh multiple ways and finally scaling up to the kind of numbers we talk about and scale is another theme which is absolutely critical for us to be a uh, keep at the back of our mind i think when you take about the digitization itself what we call as the digitization efforts we started when i was the ceo way back in uh, 2004 and then took it uh we started the digitization almost in the year 9 uh, 2000 and the evolution of that has taken so much that today 400000 employees of tcs greater than 400000 employees in from all over the world connect through that and also the knowledge management system connecting to the suppliers connecting to the uh, customers and the underlying infrastructure to support it on a scale without any disruption and the next wave of this growth in the next 5 to 10 years you will see artificial intelligence or internet of things the robotics and the uh, various technology that become available will become a part of this with the result whatever the human beings general capabilities can be used by the automation more and more automation would be pushed the creative energies and creative thinking will stay with the human capital itself the other two examples i want to talk about one is with regard to the public health area because digitization is touching not just the it industry like i said but in the whole area of public health and being a part of the public health foundation of india what i am finding with the kind of initiatives we are taken in the government requesting for various capabilities like the epidemiology etc the new paradigms for infrastructure geographical distribution of providers 
and care settings are beginning to take shape, operational excellence, which will be critical in the new normal or the next normal, and emergence of new opportunities and diversification, including medical devices, primary health centers, automation in primary health centers, family health centers, and finally, the ability to gather data in real time and analyze, analyze the data and getting into predictive analytics so that we are well prepared in terms of human capital as well as the infrastructure capabilities as we go into the next pandemic if ever it happens. I think these are some very, very critical lessons and we are seeing in the healthcare industry in a big way and the regulatory changes to address some of these will become critical. The other example I want to show was also in the area of fine arts, arts and culture. I think uh, there are a lot of premier institutions for education on the performing arts in India where they are ideally positioned to engage with India's artistic heritage as something not frozen in time, but as something that is constantly reinterpretation, reinterpreting. I think in an in increasingly interconnected world, we have got connected like never before through the transport digital communication cultures. So they have a great opportunity to connect within the country and outside and share our richness of the hearts and heritage, including awarding degrees, etc. I think this has called for skills in transmission of culture and heritage. I think digital technologies offers the dancers, the musicians, the playwriters, the plays to be connected to the larger global audience through the digital medium, throwing the rich archives for global usage. I think this is one of the mediums for transmitting even simple messages crucial for society, including sensitization, sensitization on the hygiene, sensitization on the education, and sensitization on gender parity and other social causes. So I gave you multiple examples where the digitization is having an impact and this spans across every industry, the um, various fields of which education skills is going to be one of the most crucial components. And the key point I wanted to make here is whether it was the Mandrega, which we talked about, whether it was the public health, whether it was education and skills, artisans and craftsmen, or MSME sector, or the corporate, or the, they are all scale problems, scales of an unmagnitude imagination. They can adopt both the physical and the digital model, so combination of physical and digital. They can all incorporate the technologies of the future as they come in, whether it's artificial intelligence or Internet of Things or robotics. And innovation and entrepreneurship culture is going to be absolutely crucial. The innovation ecosystem to feed into the MSMEs, to feed into the corporates, to feed into our research thinking is going to be the way. And the partnership with the various institutions in a collaborative mode is going to be absolutely key. Financing will come from multiple sources, whether it's through the governmental mechanisms or through the corporate CSR or philanthropies, will all happen. Coming to the last uh, slide on diversity, I think what I wanted to say here was this pandemic and the way things have shaped up, it has shaken all of us, the rich versus the poor divide has more or less disappeared from a pandemic point of view. can affect anybody, anywhere, any place, any time, and any mode with regard to the seriousness, resulting in a mortality, resulting in a ventilator, resulting in an oxygen mask, or resulting in a cure in terms of getting through that 14-day, 15-day, 21-day period, but leaves you shaken. So I think we all have to accept the fact the community becomes at the center of everything. More importantly, even before the community, the country, the, the planet and the nature becomes critical. And if you want to protect it, 
through a set of people, through our population at large, through the global population at large, diversity has to be accepted as a way of life and as a medium. We all have to learn from each other. We all have to get rid of the rich versus the poor, has versus the have-nots, and more importantly, it's going to be a connected, whether they are in the rural part of the country or in the urban part of the country or any part of the country or any part of the world. It's a borderless, connected world, but more importantly, the ecosystem has to be nature plus the human beings across, which will have to be rethought and re-engineered in everything we do. Same thing with regard to the skills and education, where through access, affordability, content, capacity of teachers, assessors, certification, pathways and mobility, all these become very important and place out. The financial needs I talked about and the connectivity of all this, but the richness of the data, richness of what we can do with data through analytics, through proactive actions is what is needed and any data that is given out has to be absolutely authentic and the sources of the data and the transparency of the data becomes very, very critical. So in terms of what we need to do, both in terms of short term, medium and long term has been addressed repeatedly, but I think I articulated some of these. The diversity part of it is what I want to leave with you because if you take even the incidents of uh, what has happened in the US with regard to the George Floyd incident, rethinking of public safety and emergency response is taking center stage. A global response is happening in terms of people being sensitized and we see movements across the world. And a city council in Minneapolis is talking about even dismantling of the police department itself. So the kind of disruption that are being talked about is what I want to amplify again and again. And finally, to solve some of these problems, we need an interdisciplinary culture and technology incorporation into all our thinking. The last example, which uh, again appealed to me, was the SpaceX, the California firm, with the Dragon capsule from cargo deliveries to the space station to transporting of the two astronauts in partnership with NASA and commercial travel, space travel may become a reality. I think these are some things which strikes you and challenges the human capacity and the opportunities in this country where we want to go is absolutely clear and the pandemic has only accelerated our thinking and all of us must look at a collaboration in the most intense manner, irrespective of our strata in the society, to protect the planet, to protect the environment, and to protect all of us safely. Thank you so much. I'm ready for questions. Hmm. Um, so there are certain couple of questions. So the first question is from uh, a gentleman by name Professor K. Varada um, uh, Acharya. Um, he is asking. You are talking about the digital technology, which is uh, ramp which is now um, rampantly used or extensively used. So can, can this uh, technology be used to take uh, the conventional teaching to every children? across all villages throughout the country, sir? No, I think it's absolutely possible to take the conventional teaching. I think the way we deliver has to change. It's not just a replication or a change of a teacher by a technology. The technology enhances the power of content and the power of collaboration. The last mile connectivity to the mobile or to a computer and the power guarantee for that all have to fall into place if you have to access every citizen. The teacher which I showed as an example where a single teacher in a village, how do we empower her to make a difference to the child whose curiosity is enhanced and the child connects with the internet on her own or on his own. That's the way I would put this. 
So there is one, uh, uh, I don't know whether it's a student, Diksha Singh. Uh, she says after that, after the fifth lockdown, uh, now we have about two lakh fifty-seven thousand uh, COVID cases. Do you think technology, in a way, uh, will be able to, you know, help in uh, maybe containing uh, the COVID spread in India? Yes, sir. Uh, one of the disruptions I forgot to mention was you take the typical cycle of a drug discovery going through the phase one, phase two, phase three trials in the past, and we don't even see a pure cure for HIV AIDS as an example. We are contained it, but we are not cured it. I think the duration was almost a decade or more before we saw anything in the market. What this pandemic has enabled us to look at is almost 100 plus entities are collaborating in an accelerated manner through a common digital platform to compress the phase one, phase two, phase three trials. The regulators also pitched in. The research and scientists are working together. The manufacturing capability is almost getting uh, set up even before the vaccine comes out. I think the compression we are talking about is 18 to 24 months of cycle time instead of a decade or longer. So if that happens, access to that and affordable access to that, also there are some startups from Imperial and all which I have read about, which are wanting to make sure that the needy gets as much as those who can afford and willing to pay any price. We had to address the social dimension as well as the time dimension and India is also playing a role in it through the CSIR and some of, some of the private initiatives. Um, there's one, uh, I think, Pooja Chandran, I think she's from Mumbai. Uh, what she's asking is, you know, that there are a lot of people who have migrated out of Mumbai. So what this migration means to the residents of Mumbai and also to the, the migrants who have gone back to their respective places, will technology be in a way helpful to uh, each of them? And then when we studied the migrant workers problem, I initiated a number of studies at the National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore or at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in uh, Mumbai. I think a couple of things we will have to accept. I think when the migrant workers have gone, I don't expect more than 60% to come back immediately. But what would they demand when they come? They will demand hostel facilities, they will demand a uh, public distribution system working. They will demand physical hygiene capabilities and the responsibility of the people who employ them in irrespective of the sector have to address this very clearly. I think uh, if you don't address it, they are going to be very shy of coming and also encouraging the 40% 40, 40 of the people to come back to work. The second part of addressing this distress is to create employment or entrepreneurship possibilities through the skills which the people who have migrated back to their homes and how it can be applied at a local level, at a district level, or at the panchayat level. And the database of this, we had said that if railways carried so many migrant workers and the railways know exactly who boarded and which station they got down, where they live, one can capture this data and absolutely enable an ecosystem. Third is the industries, the micro, small, medium industries, and uh, the manufacturing capabilities have to shift so that the supply chain has to go to the community rather than people coming in large numbers to the urban centers. So the urban issues have magnified and we need to address these very, very effectively. So these are the kind of interventions we need to look at when it comes to the migrant workers and their ability to come back and what the people need to do, the corporates need to do. Um, one Mr. Umesh is asking, now that uh, the new norm has come in, do you think uh, non-formal and informal kind of an education um, for uh, empowering maybe skill-based or improving the skill, will it play a major role in the post-pandemic uh, situations? I think the things that needs to be questioned is the education in its present form of going to your physical infrastructure to your college and then getting a degree there with the kind of attendant cost. Is it affordable? Is it going to be a way of life or is it going to be disrupted? To me, the scale initiative of a technology-based education but not eliminating the physical 
he is going to play out very very well i think even large institutions international institutions are grappling with this because the fees are unaffordable and people who have now one year of uh, no colleges or no um, travel are paying to pay the music so with the result i think education and skills are going to be totally disrupted pathways between skills and education and the combination of the two at the school level as part of the national education policy is going to be a way forward and the education policy when it was presented to the chairman as well as the members of that a lot of feedback has gone in integrating skills and education and certification of the teachers also in a number of enterprises that are emerging including the corporates as well as the startup ecosystem um so there is one i mean maybe may not be pertaining to this lecture there is one mr rajesh makwana uh, he is asking so what is the status of tata communications <laughs> i have no idea <laughs> Should ask them. Maybe he's got. He's one of the shareholders. I don't know. So there's another <laughs> one. Pravin Tamble. Um, uh, throughout the globe, you know, the kind of a recession is there. What he's asking is, what do you think, sir, will be the economic condition of India after the, uh, the the pandemic or during the pandemic and the effect of pandemic on the economic condition of India? I think forget about just India alone. The economic disruption. world over and the kind of numbers that have been presented starting from the most developed economy to the developing economy is not left anyone how countries tackle it and in an accelerated manner start the industry start the job enablement and wage enablement has to fuel the demand and that talks of cash in the hands of the people both the fiscal initiatives as far as the monetary initiatives have to play out very quickly and both of them should go hand in hand i think uh, that's absolutely crucial just to answer the previous point with regard to the education and skills i wanted to mention one thing like uh, when we joined tcs and even in the 80s the training period was between 12 to 18 months and then reduced to 9 months and reduced to uh three months today with the digital technology and the power of the content that is available there access from any part of the country irrespective of which college you come from i think if you are selected you are productive from day one instead of going through any of these so the comparison is zero latency in a way so that's the kind of disruption that is possible sir uh, there's one gentleman by name uh, br vishwanath um he is asking interesting question that uh, the way it companies are all uh, preparing for working from home uh, can there be a disruption and then can the schools actually have a partly online and partly in physical kind of a like uh, classes no i think the schools will undergo a change the physical and digital will play out a part and the digital is to enhance the content the visualization and the content availability not from the school teachers alone but content from anywhere any part any world anyone any expert so connectivity goes expert with the content and the realization of that through the technology tools like virtual reality becomes a real possibility i think even during the lockdown how many of us have taken lessons in various uh, either uh, foreign languages or sanskrit as an example or visual arts as an example or music as an example in addition to the regular stream of management etc etc i think the opportunities each of us have experience and we have to apply it and implement it through innovation and through entrepreneurship that's the message i would like to give so there's an interesting question by uh, anandi uh, khande parker he says uh, narega emphasizes manual labor is there any initiative on part of the government to put intellectual capital um of the rural area to use so we have given a recommendation that for the bpl families where one person in the family gets the narega benefit like as a 212 rupees a day i think in cooperation of skills and making sure that skills is a part of this whole thing and we can initiate the skill activities are already initiated skill activities through the various centers becomes a reality so we must include that as part of that and this recommendation is with the government Uh, there's another question that uh, under the skill india 
or can the vocational uh, training courses can most of it can they go online and then what kind of a new uh, skilling can happen uh, using this digital technologies i think the national skill development corporation through the various partners they have funded some of the initiatives of tatas like the tata strive the other initiatives of lnt or number of the new uh, team leads etc they are all reaching through the digital medium the skills but we have also developed through a program called ignite and tcs simulators for welding for driving for uh, various aspects of the manufacturing shop floor itself and that is going to be compressing the time and learning through the digital medium bandwidth availability is a must but i think it is can reach any part of the country in anywhere that's easy um sir there is one i think he must be a doctor professional doctor he says uh, covid pandemic has taught many people um the health is very important and um, pre prevention etc uh, since uh, can now will the government give more emphasis on preventive health care hereafter and can technology be used for this preventive health care yes i think both the uh, tele medicine tele health tele consulting is again going to be growing every doctor i have met during the lockdown when they are doing tele consulting or tele medicine advice they felt that they have been able to handle more number of people who had unnecessarily come waited in their clinic and then after two or three hours gone back because of the throughput itself today they are able to understand it and second point i also made is through the arts and culture the education and skills we can send these messages of well being rather than when you have a problem come to us basic hygiene capabilities basic capabilities of how do you wash your hand every single part of it including corporates are doing that message in a big way if you take uh, hindustan lever as an example if you take procter and gamble as an example if you take tata as an example and other corporates are also there i think these are social messages in the places they are present tata steel and then an enormous amount in this area around jamshedpur and every corporate which are present there is communicating these messages we want to carry it down to the msme sector so that the message gets around to the large population so the Uh, Mr. Madan Gopal, he is the director of the Vishweshwara Museum in Bangalore. Uh, he says that uh, can technology be a solution provider for migrant uh, migrants? Or can uh, because technology now that the digital, uh, I mean the network connectivity is going to the villages. Can companies like TCS and others um, go to the hinterland and uh, can we skill these uh, my migrant laborers in some of these activities or the future generation from villages? Well, I think, like I said, the jobs and the producing the capability for the job must go to the rural hinterland of the country through technology and through a physical presence. I think we just have to remember, just like I said, when the Spanish flu came and it affected the whole world and everybody was wearing a mask. Today, the distance has been compressed so much through the telecommunication and digital communications. it's possible to do anything remotely and we have the capability to do it and we have the entrepreneurial energy to do it i think we have to think different and showcase through pilots and through scaled up pilots that it is possible and it's happening just like the it industry um there are several other questions i too i'm not sure how many more we can take sir um yeah, we can take three or four sir three, three more three more questions um there is one oh, Uh, Viraj Singh, degree is important or skills? <laughs> He's talking about that whether a formal um, um, degree or uh, the technological skills uh, which are important, sir. In your, I think if your uh, assessment, selection, and enablement procedures with regard to ensuring the candidates has a fair content availability, to me a degree does not matter. We have said that we need some of those brands because people want to experience that you are recruited from iit or from a bits pilani or whatever it is or from a social sciences background or whatever it is but i think the creativity comes in getting the best mind irrespective of the degree and how do you unleash that potential in a collaborative mode is more important than just a degree degree helps because the institution behind it gives those inputs but then is it affordable to everybody is the question which we pose and that's the change that we need to bring in there's one gentleman by name dr basavraj balapgol uh, 
Bala Prol. Uh, he's asking post COVID-19, what uh, you feel will be the educational scenario in India now that technology is actually playing a major role uh, for the uh, for education as well. If any one of us can show a differentiator, irrespective of we deliver it through technology or deliver it through a physical presence, a differentiator will take you forward rather than run of the mill type of institutions. And that's the change which is going to happen faster because the students, the aspiring students have a choice to make and choice to make between digital and physical or purely physical. So there's one gentleman by name Nishan. Uh, we keep talking about uh, skilled human. Uh, what is need to be done to our education system for better development of the human resources? I think he should give his inputs or study the national education policy where some of these aspects are embedded. It right. was uh, headed by nobody other than Professor Kasturangan. Yeah, I think uh, these are some of the, the, the questions that uh, came up. Um, you interestingly talked about the soft power of the, the culture of India. Mm, I mean, that's one of the major uh, soft power as far as international this thing is concerned. Maybe technology and uh, um, the art, culture, architecture, um, I think can go along very well. And the craftsmen, I think we had at one point of time, the best of craftsmen. We talked about how to integrate the, the technology and the craftsman skill. So perhaps all these things are going to be um, beneficial to India. And um, in every disruption, there, there's always uh, a possibility of a spin-off benefit, which you talked about, sir. So we hope that uh, this disruption and the COVID pandemic will also um, bring in some new opportunities like you, uh, several of them you brought in, sir. Thank you so very much. And then if you have any message to the school students, because a lot of the school students are asking, you know, because of this uh, close down, there is uh, uh, some kind of a pressure on them that when will the schools open? Most of the students are asking what happens if the schools don't open. So what what kind of a message you have for the school students? Sir? Well, I think for them to be as creative as they can and demonstrate that they are eager to have the socialization possibility at a physical school or physical space. Second is the digital medium offers an enormous capability, whether it's in the area of STEM or in the area of other arts disciplines. Even an institution like NIAS in Bangalore has created what we call as a digital humpy. The whole digital humpy creation gives you not only the power of that uh, place, but also the architecture behind it and the thinking behind it, which means your engineering discipline or the physics discipline or the science discipline or the mathematics discipline automatically gets integrated into your thinking. The future students, we want to come out with both the right and the left brain capabilities to be adequately used so that we get the best creative energy output of this country and that's the cultural heritage of this country. I think they should think that it is a moment in time, which is an opportunity and tomorrow, once the pandemic is uh, controlled and finally a vaccine is found, they will have enormous capability to socialize at the school as well as the digital medium as a combination of those. So there's one message which has come on my WhatsApp. So I, I it's not his yes, uh, comment. Oh, what he's telling is that I mean, um, most of the Silicon Valley in the US, there are lots of Indian students. And, um, and now that this has happened, what do you think when whether if they come back to India, will the um, will the IT scenario in India support them? I think if you look at the last uh, decade or so, number of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs have set up a number of startups with Bangalore, Hyderabad, Mumbai, Delhi, Gurgaon, Calcutta, etc. So that has already happened. Second is a new set of entrepreneurs are coming out of our colleges, irrespective of which college. And then starting startups rather than joining corporates or joining large companies, which is going to be competing with the Silicon Valley itself because the market access is 1.3 billion people in India. So I think you are seeing a movement. So if the person who has asked the question, he wants to be an entrepreneur, he can't be a better time. In fact, he's late, he better get into it quickly because there's a lot of money available and a lot of talent available. And it's only the ideas and execution of those ideas that's going to make it. Okay, sir. I think we had. There's one. Uh, uh, what would be, uh, there's one, Mr. S. V. Patil. Uh, he's asking what would be the role of change management in uh, 
embracing this new technology from the management perspective i think he's a management uh, professor mm. i think uh, the example i gave about tcs or some of the other companies essentially shifting an operation from four lakh people on the ground at a physical premises to home and how do you do that change which involves not just moving the people it involves moving the infrastructure ensuring the security of that infrastructure ensuring communication with the customers at large including the families which are going to be there at the homes when this whole dimension is thought through it's a change management issue so you got to look at these case studies i'm sure organizations will come out with case studies in due course and some of the institutions in this country must take up a case study in coming to this change management how it was handled a case study of an organization would make a lot of difference so well, lot of the the lot of the people online are have profusely thanked you for your wonderful lecture and an optimistic uh, way forward post the covid pandemic which has really caused a lot of depression uh, and uh, economic so if at 75 i am optimistic at 25 20 etc they should be a lot more optimistic and telling me to be optimistic <laughs> okay sir thank you so very much sir on behalf of the again the nehru science center thank the history so of culture and all our students uh, it gives me immense pleasure to thank you so very much for sparing your valuable time sir thank you so much sir and uh, thank everyone for joining and logging in and if there are any more uh, offline questions they can always send it and yes sir I'll... thank you so sir. again i mean audience um, sir has already told you that uh, if you have any other questions so i know uh, i must have missed quite a lot of them because the 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 comments are running very fast i also can have my own pace at which i can actually look at these questions so we will take this offline questions and send it to sir and uh, the the answer that he, he will send to us we will send it to you through email um again on behalf of the nehru science center i would like to thank thank you all and uh, looking forward to i mean hopefully opening up the science center so that you come online to visit our science center thank you again thank you sir and all of you stay safe